Hello, y'all. Welcome to Hotep Ish. Intelligent Ish Talk. Sometimes intelligent shit talk. No shit talk today. We talking that ish. We talking that because you know we like to balance the profile with the profane here. I'm your host, Dewan B. Today we balancing the profane with the profound. Information on Cuba and how it's helping with the COVID crisis and what you can do can help to help. And one of the people who's been leading the way in getting our Cuban medical team here in the United States. We've had a program before. This is a follow-up. And I like to have this man on as much as I can because he's just full of information and someone that I always learn from. And I hope you learn from him today. Introducing my special guest, Mr. Obi Igbuna. How you doing today, brother? I'm junior. fine, brother. Yes, sir. I yes, put that sir. junior on there. Yeah, you got to. Yes, um, yes, yes. Th- thank you so much, Sean. Um, it's an honor to be back. And a lot has happened since we last connected. <laughs> a whole lot has happened since the last we connected. Yes, most definitely. And, you know, it looks like this COVID crisis isn't going anywhere anytime soon. So no. this is something that we need to make sure that we, you know, stay in touch and stay on top of. Because yes, sir. it's a service to our people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we're gonna get right on into it. Um, I got a few questions to ask you, and feel mm-hmm. free to expound and go as long as you need to go without under mm. any time constrictions, right? Uh, right uh-huh. like, we, like we was before. So if you need to go past an hour, that's fine. That's what, okay. Okay, cool. But if you got if you gotta go, I'm cool with that too. So let, let's yes, let's let's get right on into it. Okay. The last time we had you on the appeal for pushing for Cuban medical personnel. I'm sorry. I, I, I read that all wrong. The last time we had you on the appeal of pushing for Cuban medical personnel had yet to be completed and released to the, to the world. Now, a few months later, describe what it took to get the support of the national council of churches, former national medical association, Dr. Lucille Novel Perez, daughter of Ghana's first president, uh, I can't pronounce the first name, Dr. Oh, Kwame Nkumra. Mm-hmm. Kwame Nkumra. That, that, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about him later, a little later on, but you got her daughter sure. on to it. Wow. That's some, that's some, I don't know if people know how big that is. Uh, political <laughs> prisoner icons like Mubi Abdul-Jamal and Russell Maroon uh, Schultz. Former U.S. Congressman and Green Party presidential candidate Dr. Cynthia McKinney. Academics like Dr. Mark Lamont Hill, Dr. Asante, oh, and Dr. Tony Browder, and also uh, Ida Rodriguez. And you guys know Ida from uh, this show, so you've got a lot of people to sign on. Tony Browder, yes. I like everybody on this list, but Tony Browder, shouts out to you. He's someone I'm trying to get to interview, and I would love to interview anytime soon because he's an important person. So you got some real shot callers on this uh, list right here. How'd you get all that to happen? Um, constant daily work. Um, and to to their credit, they recognize that um, this had to happen. Um, our struggle to eradicate the um, corona pandemic is part and parcel of our struggle for quality health care since our ancestors arrived here with chains. Um, and many people have different historical points of reference. For some, it could be uh, Booker T. Washington's effort starting um, Negro Health Week at the turn of the 20th century. For others, it could be Du Bois' um, sociological study, the physique and health of the Negro American. For others, it could be in 1896, the same year as Plessy versus Ferguson, the same year as the creation of the National Association of Colored Women, the same year that Booker T. Washington hired George Washington Carver at Tuskegee, 1896. Um, what happened was our people could not join the American Medical Association because of racism, because of naked white terrorism and white supremacy and the attitude and the culture that um, ingrained, that being ingrained in the culture at the time. So in the spirit of self-determination, our people started the National Medical Association that and every until this day, every African that's a U.S. born African that's a doctor belongs to that organization. So we have... Um, a broad range of references, but we know that our dehumanization, our exploitation, um, the terrorism we encounter, 
lack of education and lack of quality health care go with that. So this is an ongoing struggle. So to those who recognize Cuba's role as a paragon of virtues in relationship to the arena of health, it was a no brainer. No one put up any resistance at all. And like you said, I mean, we have a laundry list of fighters who are willing to wage this fight with us. And we're so proud and humbled and yet historically obligated to do the heavy lifting. And we're going to lift as heavy as we can. That's what's up, man. That's a lot of heavy lifting. Because <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's just because it's, you're, you're starting from the ground. You know, a lot mm. of times people, they see the end result. They see all these people, these names on these different things. Mm-hmm. And they see the finished product. They don't know mm-hmm. what it took to get to that because we come in like, you know, you, you came. I remember when, when we when you and I first talked, you came with a vision. You had a clear plan. It was very easy to follow. And you already had all of your uh, T's dotted, uh, I's dotted and T's crossed and periods at the end, the punctuation, all the good stuff. You mm-hmm. had that ready right away. And... <laughs> To have that ready and then have people, it, that's what it takes to get so many people on and so many important people on to something like this. Um, mm-hmm. So I, that, that that's just a uh, just commendation to your great work. Um, I got another question for you. Mm-hmm. Last week, the Honorable <laughs> Louis Farrakhan in his international message called for the Cuban doctors to come to the United States. How does it feel to have someone of the minister of the minister's stature and pedigree lend his voice to a program that already is in motion? Had there been any communication with you and the minister prior to this? Well, if there was, let, let us know. Uh, what's up? Um, well, of course, um, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan um, lending his voice to anything that you're fighting for gives um, dimension, substance and integrity to the fight. Um, prior to the appeal coming public, we had regular correspondence with uh, Minister Abdul Malik Muhammad, who is the West Coast Regional Minister. Um, Brother Abdul Muhammad, um, formerly Robert Muhammad, the minister, who is the um, Southern Regional Minister. And um, I live in Washington, D.C., so we had regular correspondence with Abdul Qadir Muhammad who is the Mid-Atlantic Regional Minister. Um, So we let them know that um, we were doing this and to get word to the minister that it was happening and anything that he could do to bring attention to the issue we'd appreciate. Um, Prior to him coming out last week, one of the uh, correspondents of the Final Call newspaper, Brian Muhammad, did an article about Cuba's medical efforts all over the world and in particular um, dealing with the corona pandemic. And they quoted the Get Out of Cuba Way movement, which is what we're calling this, about four or five times in a very um, huge article. It was like three op-eds combined, probably about 4,000 words. So they quoted us about four different times. So we were extremely humbled that they did that. But um, prior to that, um, for five years, six years, from 2012 to 2018, I had the honor of teaching Pan-African history at Muhammad University of Islam. And during my tenure there, um, we wrote a children's play eight years ago called Cuba's Greatest Army, a tribute to the Cuban doctors. And it was performed a few times in the United States. And one of the times it was performed was at the mosque. Um, Going back about 17 years ago, Um, One of the standouts in the National Newspaper Publishers Association community and the National Association of Black Journalists community is one Nisa Islam Muhammad. And she's one of the few journalists in this country that got a chance in our community who had a chance to interview Asada Shakur in Cuba. We had helped arrange that interview. Um, One of the um, sponsors of the appeal is the former um, Minister of Health and Human Services for the Nation of Islam, the director of um, the Shiloh um, Life and Abundant Clinic, Dr. Aleem Mohammed. So the relationship is an old relationship. It's about a 30-year relationship. And um, the last time I was on, I told you 25 years ago, 
I had the honor of serving, representing an organization called the Pan-African Student Youth Movement at the time. We were on the National Youth Organizing Committee of the First Million Man March. So we're proud of our relationship with the nation. And oh, in terms of family, um, my father um, is the founder of the um, Black Panther Party in England and also the considered the face of black power in England. And um, he wrote a book in 1968 called Destroyed His Temple, which was the complement to Kwame Ture and Charles Hamilton's book, Black Power, The Politics of Liberation, that they wrote about our plight in this country. And he talks about, um, he had, when he visited the United States in 1966, 67, there were three highlights. He had audience with an indigenous Native American elder, a pristine elder, and a, New Mexi- a reservation in New Mexico. He had the chance to visit the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee's headquarters in Vine City, Atlanta. But he said the highlight of his trip was to be a guest of dinner at the house of the most powerful fighter for our people since the days of the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. So uh, inside my house, the ties to the Nation of Islam are old. But since I've been an organizer full time, giving my life to the people since 1990, we've had very strong ties with the Nation of Islam. So him and one more thing on this one. um, The youngest person to sign on to that appeal is a 16 year old named Zahir Mohammed, whose family is Nation of Islam. But he was the president of the Black Student Union at uh, DeMatha High School. And he was the youngest person to sign the appeal. But he caught and he asked that all presidents of black student unions of Catholic schools throughout the country follow his example. And uh, he called me excited. He said, you heard it. You heard it. And I said, how does it feel to be ahead of your leader? (laughs) And uh, he said, what? I said, you're already part of a campaign and an initiative that your leader just mentioned. We are, you know, and what I explained to him was there's a historical uh, parallel. Um. If, for those who know the history of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, in January of 1966, Sammy Young Jr., who's the first student to be s- murdered in the civil rights movement, was oh, wow. gunned down in, at Tuskegee at a Standard Oil gas station for using a white-only bathroom. He was a oh. military officer who had to leave the military, medically discharged, and joined SNCC. And got gunned down by a white supremacist uh, working at the gas station for using a white-only bathroom. He figured since he fought for this country, he could use the bathroom any way he wanted. Yeah, so you after think that, so? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so then after that, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee said, "Hey, if we can't, if we can't um, have um, public accommodations, at least we're definitely not fighting in the wars of this country anymore." And SNCC became the first organization in U.S. history to come out against the Vietnam War. So from January of 1966 to 1967, they put loving pressure on Dr. King, telling him how we're going to be nonviolent in Birmingham, nonviolent in Selma, nonviolent in Lowndes County, nonviolent in Montgomery, nonviolent in Monroe, North Carolina, um, nonviolent in Emeritus, Georgia, some of the most violent places. (laughs) Yeah. Um, but we 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 gonna be um, not nonviolent in Vietnam. So because of their pressure, Dr. King finally came out against the Vietnam War. So I said um, that took about a year and a half to do. But here we are, not even three months into this effort, and someone of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan's stature comes out and puts the finishing stamp on what we're fighting for. So we're humbled, we're happy, and we're definitely going to use it as momentum moving forward. That's what's up, because that's a great point that you just made. Um, how someone of Dr. King, of, of, of a Farrakhan stature, coming out and supporting it so early mm-hmm. on into it. But mm-hmm. that goes into, you know, so, you know what how this country is, I, I guess, when it comes to, to its relationship with Cuba. Mm-hmm. You know, and a lot of people in this country are don't really know what's going on down in Cuba mm-hmm. and how advanced they are medically. So having you come around speaking to this and having, you know, Farrakhan, you know, hopefully it gets people to pay attention and dig a little deeper and, and not just go with what they've been hearing about Cuba. Mm-hmm. Um, I got another question for you. Sure. 
One of our biggest one of our biggest weaknesses is the willingness and ability to follow up on a major campaign and initiative after its initial initial launching. Knowing that after the appeal, the mass emphasis, positive action, and creative youth brigade created a mini doc eight minutes and twenty six seconds long called Get Out of Cuba's Way. Please talk about the effort that went into putting that together. How has it been received? And who is the mass emphasis, positive action, and creative youth brigade prior to this uh to this mention? Oh wow. Um the Vance Emphasis Positive Action and Creativity Youth Brigade is the political complement to the Mass Emphasis Children's History and Theater Company, which okay. we created in Washington, D.C. nine years ago. We have done 20 plays in nine years, and we've had about 28 performances. Oh, wow. Prior to the pandemic, we were going to, uh, we had four new plays that our, our company was going to. Um, perform in dc some young people in la were going to do a play we just wrote called decolonization disconnection and repair in guyana we had a play that some young people were going to do about walter rodney um for those who don't know who he is he's one of the um driving forces behind revolutionary academic expression and he wrote in the opinion of many the most important book of the 1970s how europe underdeveloped africa he oh, was he was on, in hold on, hold on, Diana. Hold on. Say that yeah. again. He he's the person that wrote that book. He's the person who wrote that book, How Europe Underdeveloped. That's Africa. my next book on my read. Okay, okay. <laughs> that's my that's okay. literally my next book. And for those of you listening on the book club, that's one of our next reads. So pay close mm-hmm. attention to everything else Opie's about oh, yeah. to say. So go ahead, and, go um, ahead. My and bad. So and so what happened is um we were gonna do a play about his life. Um, And we had a play we were going to do in D.C. called Ready for the Revolution about Ahmed Sekoutoure, leader of the Guinean Revolution, the first president of Guinea, and Mbalia Kamara, who was the leader of the women's resistance in Guinea against French colonialism. So those are our new plays that will be done at some point. But we decided that um, when you take a look at our illustrious history, many of our great fighters, when they give their lives to our struggle, they give their skills to our struggle. So what I mean by that is Daisy Bates was not just a freedom fighter. She's mm-hmm. a journalist. Okay, yeah. The Honor- um, King is a preacher. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan is a preacher. Um, James Baldwin is a writer. Emil Kakabra, leader of the revolution in Guinea-Bissau, he was an agronomist. George Washington Carver is an agronomist. Harriet Tubman was a nurse. The first president of Mozambique, Samora Marshall, is a nurse. So in addition to getting their passion, their time, their energy, their fervor, We get their skills. So what we decided is that these young people should begin to develop projects centered around skills that they're harnessing at their young age. So we began last year in July, in June, on the birthday of Kwame Ture, a 10 and 13 year old DJ who come from a family of DJs did a visual mixtape tribute to Kwame Ture. That was our first project. Then a couple, then the following month, a 19 year old poet did a poem and a video called Vision, and it was dedicated to Cuba and Venezuela's project called Operation Project Miracle, whose aim and goal is to eradicate blindness in the Western Hemisphere. Okay. And and so the third project that we came up with, we had um, a young lady named Sia Lee Wright, who's 16 years old, a a young brother named Jalen Mitchell, who's 21, and Zion Yutzi, who did the song for the uh, project, they came up with, we, we put together a mini doc, Get Out of Cuba's Way, and it's young people just expressing themselves after getting exposure to why they feel that the time has come for Cuban medical personnel to come here and help eradicate this deadly genocidal pandemic. So that's that's what they've been doing, and um, we just found out yesterday that it's going to be submitted into the Pan-African Film Festival in Los Angeles and the San Francisco Film Festival in the Bay. So oh, we're very okay. happy that that and it's only eight minutes and twenty six seconds long, and we're going to get it to you so you can distribute it to your listeners so they can check it out. We're not selling okay. it; it belongs to the people. Yeah. Okay, 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 okay. That's what's up. That's what's up. So you get mm-hmm. the kids involved, and like I said, that's that's I think mm-hmm. that's a very big thing getting the children involved because oh yeah, 
Because, you know, uh, a lot of times people our age, or especially older, they have their ways sort of set in. But, mm-hmm. you know, it's like if you can't get them this time, you get them to the next go around. So if the, the children understand mm-hmm. the dynamics, you know, that's a, yeah. I think a, that's a, that's a really good thing. Many of them, um, unfortunately, they have a, a established perception of what children will embrace and what children would reject, yes. which, in, in our humble opinion, gives them the excuse of not accepting the responsibility and challenge, the historical responsibility and challenge to mm. expose the young people to this and to let it just take its course after they've done the exposure. Yes, yes And yes. we've always said for many years if there is a line thinner than the line between love and hate, it's the line between exposure and imposition. We will impose nothing on our children, but expose them to everything that can take intensify our genuine resistance, because that's what we're obligated to do historically anyway. Yes, 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 yes. Good work, good work. Uh, I want you. I want to thank you guys, everybody, for listening in. You're listening to Hotep Ish Intelligent Ish Talk, Intelligent Shit Talk. We are here live with our <laughs> special guest. Mr. Obi Igbona. Well, today we focus on the intelligent side of the talk. Getting you guys gamed up. Um, I got another question for you. Mm-hmm. As we know, the protests against the police terrorism that one recently uh, was sparked by the uh, George Floyd incident in Ahmaud Arbery, Rashad Brooks, mm-hmm. it's occupied so much coverage and space and political capital. How did this impact on a work fighting for Cuban medical personnel coming to U- U.S. borders. As someone uh, who's been part of uh, protests, uh, protest t- activity over the last 30 years, mm-hmm. connecting the fight against naked police terrorism inside U.S. borders and U.S. Imper- imperialism abroad, what's the connection between the two? Ah, um, well, for us, um, we don't want the United States and the European Union policing African people and any other oppressed people anywhere in the world, Mm -hmm. they're tied in. One of the things that we know is that the, um, it can be argued the first form of public transportation were the ships that captured our ancestors. And like public transportation, there are stopping points and drop off points, there are pickup points and drop off points anywhere. Mm -hmm. So we weren't just dropped off in the United States, we were dropped off in Haiti, Mm -hmm. dropped off in the Dominican Republic, dropped off in Cuba, dropped off in Puerto Rico, dropped off in Panama, dropped off in Jamaica, dropped off in all these places. So quite naturally, since the the blockade on Cuba is a form of policing, the the 635 failed assassination attempts on Comandante Fidel Castro (laughs) is an attempted policing. 635 times Comandante Fidel Castro was supposed to end up like Medgar Evers in Mississippi, Herbert Lee in Mississippi, end up like um, Dr. King in Memphis, Tennessee, end up like Malcolm X in Harlem, end up like Fred Hampton in Chicago. So the fact that, um, and and it was for the same reason and by the same forces. So Mm -hmm. there's no separation for us. When we were babies in struggle um, and we shut down Washington, D.C., in connection to the Rodney King rebellions, which people like Jane Fonda call so full of hate and rage, isn't it only natural that white liberals consider genuine nationalist expression hateful and full of rage? But that's a whole nother conversation. People ain't ready to have that conversation. (laughs) But but anyway, um, we let it be known in the 1990s when we were fighting against police terrorism inside the United States. One of the things we clearly understood, we looked at Africa and we saw that Mobutu's Mobutu, who who um, assassinated Patrice Lumumba mm-hmm. with the assistance of the CIA and cold blood, threw acid on his body. Mm. He was overthrown in the nineties. We said this is the same fight. Um, the two CIA trained mercenary units in su- southern Africa, Renamo in Mozambique and Unida in Angola, the the maximum resistance happened um, by the people stood up to them. Doe in Liberia overthrown, Mengistu in Ethiopia overthrown by the mighty people of Eritrea. Um, in the Cameroon, the people rose up against Paul Biot. So the one thing that African people all over the world, in Africa and in the diaspora, in the 90s, we said we emphatically let it be known by our action that we weren't going to tolerate fascist policing, whether it was from an installed puppet neo-colonialist regime at the governmental level or the police. And remember, 
This is from the lens and prism of a 50-year-old who's got 30 years in struggle who lives in Washington, D.C. I see more police when I walk out my door than in one day than most people in the U.S. going to see their whole life. Dewan, we have library police, park police with no unlimited jurisdiction, Capitol Hill police, Secret Service police, postal police, housing, po- housing police, postal police, uh, um, cap- um, the Secret Service, the DEA, the ATF, the FBI, the CIA. For those of you who ain't never seen an FBI squat car before, the Pentagon. So quite naturally, our outlook on the police is has a Pan-African and international character. So we see the struggle to end the blockade on Cuba, lift the sanctions on Zimbabwe, lift the sanctions on Venezuela as part of the fight in Ferguson, part of the fight in D.C., part of the fight in Chicago, part of the fight in New York. We have never accepted the amputated narrative of the African experience, and we never will. That's a great answer right there. Um, you're right. We, we're, we, it's, it's funny because people around the world sometimes, because of the imagery shown by the European, they think that black that, that the people of the earth just, just take this abuse lying down. We never have. We never will. And... No, and- Go ahead. And 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 the, and the thing about that is, twenty we we are about we're on the verge of losing twenty five thousand lives as a result of the Corona pandemic. And one thing I I know my people, I know my people, the average sister or brother in this country will face a whole police department with a plastic spoon and knife, then go to the hospital. <laughs> what does that tell you? We're more afraid of the hospitals in this country than the police. And so the climate and atmosphere is set up for us to push for the Cubans to come here. That's how the fights are connected. And, and, when, and when it comes to our fear of the medical system, we have a legitimate gripe, just like we do with yeah. the police. What? You, you know, uh, I'm over <laughs> here. I just cracked open that book, Medical Apartheid, but I, I got to read that book like three pages <laughs> at a time, man. This is yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I recommend, if you think, because sometimes people get caught up and think this is pseudo, this conspiracy. Look, we Mm. we live in a country where our country's media is a type, is very, very contrived. It's it's, it's edited. And Mm. and, and usually you know you point it in the right direction when they start calling it pseudo and conspiracy. If you you hear that, keep reading. And pick up that book, (laughs) A Medical Apartheid. It's talking mm-hmm. about real things that really happened. It's going through 2016, so this ain't we ain't talking about just a, just a Tuskegee experiment. We talking about mm-hmm. a lot more. And if you got the if you got the stomach to read it, pick it up. What you got to say about and, that? And 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 well, I'll say this much. Um, now, with people talking about the freedom of information as it pertains to the U.S. Constitution, there's a distinction that the United States of America has. Now, Woodrow Wilson's crowning achievement uh, that they tell you in their books is that he created the League of Nations, the precursor to the United Nations. But the United States government is one, whether the Democrats or Republicans are at the helm, is arguably the only country in the world that when the United Nations General Assembly convenes in September, and the whole world assembles in one physical location and discuss the basic needs and challenges that the whole world faces together, the most intense political challenges, the most intense economic challenges, the most intense environmental challenges, the most intense educational challenges, the most intense health challenges. They're the only ones who don't cover it on a regular basis and discuss it on their media outlets. The only thing they show is the U.S. president giving the opening remarks because Mm -hmm. it's physically located in the United States. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I'm bringing that up is because 10 years ago, I had the opportunity um, in my capacity as the U.S. correspondent to Zimbabwe's national newspaper, The Herald. Every General Assembly, I'm part of the president of Zimbabwe's press team. So we cover his movement throughout the U.N. for the duration of time that he's here. So um, at the time, late President Mugabe, the Pan-African revolutionary icon, we're with him. And there's a special meeting between the World Health Organization and all the African nations. And it was revealed 10 years ago that there was a projection that, well, number one, non-communicable diseases, which are um, heart attacks, Mm -hmm. strokes, diabetes, cancer, high blood pressure. Internal shit, in other words. (laughs) had, Had now surpassed 
HIV, AIDS, cholera, Ooh. and malaria as the number one killer of the human being. And according to the World Health Organization, it was projected that between 2010 and 2038, they were expecting 57 million people to die from non-communicable diseases. And when the African nations collectively sighed and said they were obviously um, in awe of the number and asked why, they said because when, um, as global pollution intensifies, which... Uh, the United States likes to casually call climate change, but the real name is global pollution, global contamination. They were saying because of global contamination being at an all-time high, when pandemics that are environment-related invade your territorial space, the most vulnerable people are people with respiratory issues. So the fact that they have respiratory issues, would this is the reason you will see... Um, expeditiously death from so they so in a nutshell the whole world was informed 10 years ago about the corona pandemic and other similar problems and because the united states functions from the premise that they are superior to the rest of the world they felt that they could um ignore this information hmm. and deprive um, their citizens of this information. And now they are paying the price for it. And also that is connected to another issue. Um, for the last 25 years, the world has dealt with what's called millennial development goals. And now they are called sustainable development goals. So every country is supposed to have at least on the books a roadmap to, to ensure their citizens have clean drinking water, housing, health care, and education. These basic essentials. But this is the demand of the world at a time in history where, according to Forbes magazine, they just came out with the new figures, you have 2,091 billionaires worth $9 trillion and 784 million people on the planet that live on $1.90 a day or less. And um, of that 784 million that they casually called the extreme poor, 400 million of them live on the African continent. Of the 25 poorest nations on the planet, 22 of them are African nations. The other three are Haiti, the Solomon Islands, and Afghanistan. Now, I don't know about you, but if you go to Haiti and you go to the Solomon Islands, if I told you you were in Burkina Faso, if I told you you were in Uganda, if I told you you were in Namibia, if I told you you were in Sao Tome and Principe, you'd believe me. So this shows, and in this country, we are 21% of the poor, even though we're only 12% of the general population. So this, this health challenge we have, health challenges we have, you have to put them in the global economic context and the global political context, the global cultural context, and the global social context. So when you begin to craft solutions that are organized solutions, that are aimed at being sustainable, you have to take all of that into consideration. But it shouldn't discourage you. On the other hand, it should inspire you. Yeah, that uh, that that's real talk. Putting it in context like that, because you know one of the talking points a lot of people make when they are talking about the COVID crisis affecting Black America, they forget about the economic part, and the economic part is part a major reason why the medical part is in the nice. It's a full chain of exactly. events. It's yes. not just hey, Black folks ain't wearing a mask. That's why we the most give. No. <laughs> <laughs> It, it, it goes it goes a lot deeper than a damn mass, people, and that's part of the reason why uh, I got I like talking to Obi and bringing him on to bring in the uh, context of how this de disease is being fought worldwide. Because over here in the United States, in the last couple months, the conversation basically got whittled down into a mask. You know, mm -hmm. don't talk about washing hands. Don't talk about alternative health care. Don't talk about eating mm -hmm. right. Don't talk about what's going on in Cuba, Japan, New Zealand, and these other places that aren't really dealing with the COVID. Don't talk about none of that stuff. Just wear a mask and shut the F up 
is what a lot of people are saying. And, and one thing is throwing, is throwing me off because people, like, mm -hmm. it's like people are getting real mean and hateful towards one another. You know what I mean? Yeah. And how embarrassing is it that a country that you've tried to destroy through a blockade, through a failed invasion in 1961, a country that actually, if we want to go back in history, the first seven presidents of this country tried to annex. The Spanish-American War is a war over who would control Cuba. So Cuba was supposed to be annexed like Texas and California were from Mexico. Mm -hmm. Like Spain did Florida. Mm -hmm. So so Cuba fought them off. And the fact that, um, I mean, so the, the bond has always been there. Um, for those who know the history of the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey and the Universal Negro Improvement Association, they had 46 branches in Cuba. Um, the One of the Black Star Line ships is named in honor of General Antonio Maceo, who we affectionately call the Bronze Titan, who was an African, who was the main guerrilla fighter against Spanish and United States efforts to annex Cuba. Mm. Um, the first all-African political party in the Western Hemisphere was created in Cuba in 1908. Mm. Partido Independiente de Color, which means the Independent Party of Color. So we did in Cuba, Brother Dewan and listeners, in 1908 what we did in Lowndes County in 1965 with the first Black Panther Party. What we did in Mississippi with the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. What we um, did in Africa with the Convention People's Party in Ghana and the Democratic Party of Guinea, the Party of the Independence of Guinea and Cape Verde. So when you look at our history of having self-determining parties, you look at that. And I'm mentioning that because I know that many people, when they think of Cuba, they instinctively think of Comandante Fidel Castro and Che Guevara. And they don't go back before that. But obviously we want to. And um, 19 years before Nat Turner did his thing. You had a warrior, African warrior in Cuba named Jose Aponte, and he led a rebellion there, and he scared them so bad with his rebellion, they chopped his head off and put it in a cage Damn. and and put it in the front of Havana at the point of entry to intimidate all other Africans. All it did is inspire us. We had 300 rebellions in Cuba alone. So we did what Nat Turner did in Cuba 300 times, what Gabriel Prosser did in Cuba 300 times, what Charles Durslander did in New Orleans in Cuba 300 times, what we did in Haiti 300 times. So yeah, so we the fighting spirit, the African fighting spirit is alive and well in Cuba. And the only way it's distinguished from the fighting spirit here is the fighting spirit. We express ourselves in English. They express themselves in Spanish. That is the only difference. Oh, and our ancestors in Cuba, they chop sugar cane. Our ancestors in the Carolinas and Mississippi and Alabama um, pick cotton and tobacco. If you want to make a distinction, <laughs> you still were out there from sun up to sundown. Look, our Cuban <laughs> ancestors, ancestors practice same to the year. Uh, our our black ancestors practice voodoo. <laughs> yes. Our our American ancestors, we do jazz. They do salsa. It's, it's, it really is a, a common brotherhood. And, and for your jazz and for your jazz fans, um, I would like them to go um, when they watch the documentary. They're going to hear some music in the background and say, "Ah, oh, that's some beautiful music." Um, there's an African band in Cuba that was formed in 19 late 30s, early 40s called Machito, okay. and the two and the two first musicians to go and do an album with them were none other than Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker. Oh, so that's the music that you hear in the background when you watch the documentary. So oh, yeah, so hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm 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 actually at my computer right now. I'm about to go to <laughs> iTunes. I did not know that. I'm about. I don't want to yeah. freeze my computer. Let me. Let me. Where, where's yeah. the pin? What's the name of that? What, what, Machito. Machito. And Ma you can just type in M A C H I T O. You can type in Machito with Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie. So, in addition to being the first uh, jazz artist to make an album with the string orchestra, Charlie Parker is the first jazz artist to make a connection with our sister, our Spanish-speaking African sisters and brothers in Cuba to make beautiful music together. The same music we're making on the front line when we fight this pandemic together right now. I'm a huge Bird and Dizzy fan. I did not know they had that album, Machita. 
I'm yeah. also looking with my, at with, was, the, with the with the group Machita. With the group, oh, with the group Machita. Machita. Okay. Yeah, but they okay. but they made that collab with them, man. It's some okay. of the most uh, it's some of the most incredible music I've ever heard. So you know, we the the young people wanted like a musical backdrop. So I let them hear that, and they put it in the doc. So when you hear the children talking and making their points mm. and making their demands. You just hear this real beautiful music in the background. And so if the music catches your attention, that's who, that's who it is. Mm -hmm. You kind of dove it. You sort of dove into the, uh, the next question dovetailed into the next question. Sure. Um, about the, the children's of the mini doc. Um, so you talked mm -hmm. about, did you, you talked about the mini doc with the children. Talk to us more about the mini, the Bible, uh, about the children in, in the mini doc. Yeah, well, they're my students, um, most of them, and um, I teach, um, I've been teaching um, Pan-African history K through 12 for the last 30 years, mm -hmm. and um, my main teacher now is through the Sankofa Homeschool Community. In the past, I've taught at Muhammad University of Islam um, once a year um, before my son was born. I was going to um, Highway 80 um, up and down uh, Alabama from Montgomery to Birmingham teaching in the public schools there. Um, so I've taught homeschool students. I've taught African independent school students. I mentioned earlier, I've had the honor of being one of the only non-Nation of Islam members to have a chance to teach their children. Mm -hmm. And they want me back. Uh, and I probably am going to go back if we're able to work out um, how I want to do it. But I'm open to it. And um, so, yeah, so I've taught um, in the public schools, I've taught in the private schools, I've taught in the African independent schools, I've taught in the public charter schools, um, you name it. Um, and we, and of course, we've taught home schools. Um, we've taught for the Aya Educational Institute and Liberated Minds um, Institutes in Atlanta, the Fawa Hode Institute in Atlanta, which are all out of the African independent tradition with their home school. Um, the, our main one is Sankofa Homeschool, Black Star Academy in Birmingham. So we've um, we've taught just about everywhere, and um, there's now and now there's a network of homeschoolers from the West Coast, Dr. Deborah Watkins and the Abbott Network, who are now partnering with us. So we're oh, going to okay. have more access. So we're going to have more access to um, West Coast schools moving forward. And uh, one of our partners in terms of our work in the South is is Dr. Tony Browder. He was doing it down there before me, but I believe I've had a chance to go into more schools. I think. In the last nine years, I've been in 50. And my focus is K through 12. I'm not smart enough to teach at the university level. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, this isn't one. Uh, I, I want you to um, please, please go a little further into the the homeschooling network. Just, uh, mm -hmm. I, I know it's off the cuff because I have a lot of listeners uh, because I have my other podcast, the Breakthrough Podcast. Sure. Where I, give tips and tri tricks to parents on raising mm -hmm. their black children in a racist society. And I there push for homeschool. Okay. Um, it, it was sort of out there a few years ago, but now the coronavirus, people are starting to uh, yes. uh, come around. So talk to us more Brother, about that. I, I, had, um, I had 50 students this last semester, and I'm going into my third week with uh, 28 of them in the summer. Um the Sankofa homeschool community has been around for about 15 years, but it solidified itself about nine years ago. It's two um, African women, um, Monica Utsi and Jessica Silva, who started it. And it's a combination of different programs. It's remarkable. So, But beyond the corona pandemic, at a moment where um, 8,000 children drop out of school in the United States every day, mm. at a moment where... Um, the standardized testing directive is, in the perception of many, an effort to phase out all aspects of learning that deal with critical thinking, which for us going through the process of decolonization is of paramount importance, to say the least. So when you phase geography out of schools, when you're phasing history out of schools, when you're phasing social studies out of school, when you're phasing um, literature out of schools, this is this is what you can encounter. And look at it this way. So where the Dr. Carter G. Woodson's and the Du Bois and the J.A. Rogers and the Anna Julia Coopers and the Mary Church Terrells and the Nanny Helen Burroughs and the Ida B. Wells, where are they supposed to come from? If, if this is a deliberate assault, a cultural assault, an intellectual assault on our people. So if you're interested, um, 
I will forward Dewan the information for Sankofa Homeschool Community. Not only that, Dewan, one of my common practices, because I respect independent me- media so much as we're fighting a, pro- a propaganda war, I'll arrange for the two sisters to come on your show. And not only that, I'll arrange for Tony Browder to come on your show. Because uh, you said that you want that. I'll take care of you. I, I really so, will, because um, in that, this is synchronicity right here, because shouts mm-hmm. out to one of my faithful listeners, Yolanda. She, uh, put me in she she gave me the information of tony browder and i was just getting ready to reach out because he is so important and i was mm-hmm. matter of fact i was about to order his purse his timeline just for myself that he has okay. yeah he's so important to our people so if mm-hmm. you can hook that up and also you're saying kofa uh school teachers because yeah i want the, i no, really would like teachers. to they're i want to have the, they're the directors of the program and directors uh, it, it, yeah it'd be great to have them on not just because they're women but um, you and I, when we first started talking, um, our thing um, at this historical moment is to take full advantage of living in Washington, D.C. Um, what do I mean by that? Are we the best organizers in the country? That's up for debate. And it would be arrogant to make that proclamation. But I could tell you one thing. We're the most strategically important. And for that reason, hey, it's hey, imper- hey, hey, it's ain't, imper- no, ain't no arguing that, brother. <laughs> and and it's in, so so it's in, so it's incumbent upon us that when we have platforms like this, we connect you to the work that's going on at the grassroots level in D.C. Because many of the obstacles that you're encountering and will encounter down the pipe, we're already dealing with and attempting to overcome in the spirit of genuine resistance. So a lot of the programs and what happens a lot of times is when national spokespeople, the most visible spokespeople, or some or some like to call them our leaders, um, when they come to D.C., they don't get a chance to sit down with the people who are working on the ground. So they don't get a chance to really watch how we apply our strategic and tactical understanding, how we're waging strategic and tactical warfare at a very critical moment. So you have this gap of communication and it manifests itself sometimes on a cross-generational level. It manifests itself on a class level. But it just comes down to basic standard communication, knowing who's who. Because if you if you come into a community and you don't know who represents the genuine organizational efforts in that community, I'm going to say with no hesitation and apology, you have yet to be um, acquainted with that community. Yes, 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 yes. And I don't see how people have the luxury of thinking they can come to D.C. and not sit down with the organizers in D.C. And I think that once it happens, and it doesn't need to happen in D.C. per se, it can happen like it's happening now. But I think that the more that happens, we will see an enhancement of the quality of our resistance. I want to piggyback off what you said and why that's important from my point of view. Uh, From my point of view, why, the reason why you said it's so important, you say, you say it's important that organizers com, come to the organizers in D.C. when they, the reason before why I think that's important leave. is because they leave. Yeah. anytime you go anywhere, every mm-hmm. city, every ecosystem has its own lay of the land, has its own politics, has its own way, way of, uh, of, 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 of happening. And mm-hmm. I see, I, I see that being here in L.A. when people want to come to L.A. on certain things. Most people who I hear talk about L.A., when I hear them talk, I'm like, they have absolutely no, no, that won't work here. It would work different. Everywhere you go, you need to have respect for the people in their environment enough, enough to know that they at least understand the ropes and the hurdles of that environment, what to say, what not to say, the different mm-hmm. things, who to, who to talk to, where to talk to them, how to talk to them. These mm-hmm. things are all important because when it comes to communication, communication is best when you communicate the language of the people you're speaking to. And the best way to communicate the language, and we don't when I say language, I don't mean English. Yes, we all speak in English, but we talk, yeah, we, we know we speak English. When I say language, the same way when in the relationship between husband and wife, love languages, daughter, brother, everyone has a way of listening and hearing things. So the people who are on the ground in these communities, they know the language of those who have the power in that area. So when it comes to these different organizations, I would love to see us get past the mistakes that we made in the 60s and this ego and this nonsense. We know that don't go nowhere. <laughs> you know what I mean? We have to mm-hmm. be able to be open and not and know that we don't always have the answers, that we ain't always the biggest shit walking around. We have to be humble enough 
to coordinate and to meet with those who are in the environment we wish to gain things from. So I'm glad you said that, Brother Obi. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so that that's why I was saying, like, for example, um, when people uh, hear us talk about how we approach police terrorism, they're like, what? And we explain to them is because of what we see when we walk out of our door. And we have the most unique setup as Washington, D.C. is the surveillance capital of the world. <laughs> You understand? So, uh, yeah. So, and this is the reason why um, we're within arm's reach of any embassy that you can think of. We're in arm's reach of all the think tanks that um, set policy in this country that you can think of. So just <laughs> on a multitude of levels. And um, that that's why. But at the same time, um the most advanced organizers are humbled by that, having that responsibility and they don't hold and they don't use it as a bully, um, uh, a bully pulpit against their comrades in other parts of the country. So um, it's just something that needs to happen more. But I think that it will. And um, we're going to become more familiar with each other's efforts. And um, then we can look at the authenticity of efforts, um, look at what um, we can build on look at what's stagnating us. And um, Brother Malcolm said a long time ago that we need to submerge our differences. But moving forward, we need to have an understanding of those differences so that the enemy can't manipulate those differences. Um, I don't want to submerge the differences at the expense of not understanding what the differences are. And not looking at um, the positives um, that all our organizations bring to the table. Um, and one of, And I make this joke all the time. Arguably, the most criticized organization in our community is the NAACP. And I've heard people um, rip them from pillar to post and then sing, lift every voice and sing. When <laughs> <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So, And then it's like, wow, you don't know that James Weldon Johnson was a member of the NAACP when he came up with that? Him and his brother and his wife? So the, these are so uh, and that's why, you know, with this Cuba work, um, we take it seriously this is the work that um, Malcolm wanted us to do. This is the work that Du Bois wanted us to do. This is the work that Amiri Baraka wanted us to do. This is the work that France Fanon wanted us to do. This is the work that Kwame Ture wanted us to do. This is the work that Julian Mayfield wanted us to do. This is the work that Angela Davis um, um, came of age doing. This is the work that um, connects us to Asada Shakur. This is the work that Josephine Baker wanted us to do. These these are just some of the, this is the work that Thomas Sankara, Burkina Faso's first president, Robert Mugabe, these, mm -hmm. the, when Samora Marshall, the president of Mozambique, when his plane mysteriously crashed on October 19th, 1986, after coming back from South Africa, his two physicians were Cuban physicians. They died on the plane with him and they're considered national heroes in Mozambique. Oh, wow. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm just saying when you look at when you look at um the ties that we have to Cuba all over the world, this is what this represents. But the fact that we're able to after we did not respond properly when they said they were willing to bring 1500 environmental disaster specialists to the Gulf region after Hurricane Katrina. We were more focused on Kanye West talking about George Bush not really liking us. <laughs> You know, whatever. But we, yeah. So this gives us a chance to correct that mistake. And there is no reason. And I'm so glad you mentioned some of, for the, your listeners who don't know. The National Council of Churches is the largest church body in this country. And when they called us and said, sign them up, I could not believe it. I was so. Mm -hmm. But they had a statement out with the Cuban Council of Churches about this. And what that stems from is the fact that um, 23 years ago, the Vatican came out again for the first time ever against the blockade on Cuba, saying that it doesn't make any sense anymore. And after that, um, you began to see churches engage Cuba because the excuse that the churches um, gave for not doing humanitarian work in Cuba before was, ah, uh, the Marxist-Leninist political party and Marx says that religion is the opium of the masses. So when the Pope came to Cuba, Comandante Fidel Castro said, that had nothing to do with religion. We're not anti-Catholic. It's just that um, your, your, the Catholic Church in this country had ties to La Costa Nostra. Mm. 
the my Italian mafia, which is very uncatholic, your holiness. So we had a problem Ooh. with that. It, it had nothing to do with Catholicism. We we demonstrate because the oldest spiritual practice in Cuba is the Santa Aria, Yoruba, Nigerian practice that our ancestors carried over when they came to Cuba in chains. And we don't torment them. We don't suppress them. So we don't suppress religious freedom or spiritual freedom in Cuba. So after that, that Pope, John Paul I, which if you know history, was a milestone because he was arguably the most anti-socialist Pope the Vatican has ever had. He started a movement with George Soros called Solidarios in the late 70s. And they took credit for dismantling the Socialist Party, the Communist Party in Poland and Czechoslovakia. He was, um, so he had these strong anti-socialist credentials. So when he came to Cuba in 97, they thought he was going to call for a new government. But he said while he disagreed with the direction of the government, he felt the blockade needed to be changed, lifted. And also before he died on his deathbed, he reiterated that again. So, um, you know, we, um, and oh, and the reason we got the National Council of Churches endorsement is because of a woman who moves in the tradition of Dorothy Day, um, who was a European woman who is known for, uh, that is compared to Mother Teresa and other people who have done what we call the social gospel in our community. A woman named Joan Brown Campbell, who's the former Secretary General of the National Council of Churches, who was one of the lead negotiators to get Ileon Gonzalez back to Cuba 20 years ago. We've done some work with her through the years. And when she found out what we were doing, she called us and said, please let me know anything I could do. And the next thing you know, we're talking to um, Reverend Jim Winkler, the head of the, uh, the president of the National Council of Churches and the secretary general. And he said, um, consider us in. So just the fact that, you know, we had this broad range of support, we're continuing to build on it. But then one of the others that got to me was a woman named Alice Wyndham signed on. Um, Alice Wyndham is in her 80s. Um, Alice Wyndham was one of the people who went to Ghana after Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah led the revolution in Ghana, Ghana being the first country to gain its independence from British colonialism. And the night after Du Bois died in Ghana, before, he, he died the night before the March on Washington. So when you're celebrating the March on Washington, you got to celebrate Du Bois. But anyway, um, they marched on the U.S. Embassy in Ghana to show their solidarity with the March on Washington. And one of their demands was no intervention in Cuba. And this was two years after the failed um, Bay of Pigs invasion when the CIA tried to invade Cuba. And Kennedy, a Democrat, many of our people's favorite Democrat, who we say is on the Mount Rushmore of white liberals, uh, he is the one who instituted the blockade against Cuba that still exists. So the fact we had Alice Wyndham sign on, like I said, even though we appreciated all the signees, um, that 16-year-old Zahir Muhammad, whose 14-year-old brother wrote an article about the appeal that was published in the San Francisco Bayview newspaper, and he ain't nothing but 14. Mm -hmm. I so remember, yeah, we yeah, I sent that. That, yeah, we sent that to you. So yes, so just the fact that um, we have the cross-generational support, we have support all up and down the spectrum, that can't do anything but motivate you to fight harder, and we're going to keep fighting. We're going to make this happen. And for people who say, ah, ah you know it's going to take a while, that's the history of our struggle, is it not? Mm -hmm. Plessy, Plessy versus Ferguson Plessy happened versus in 1896. Ferguson, yeah. Brown versus Boyd, 1954. Uh -huh. I Bayard, Rus Bayard Rustin and A. Philip Randolph, real quickly, called for a march on Washington in 1941. Mm -hmm. It happened in 63. Yep. This ain't um, nothing new. <laughs> the, Washington, the Washington Redskins said they're going to change their name yesterday. We have been helping the American Indian in, in 1991 the American Indian Movement Ground Governing Council formed the National Coalition Against Racism in Sports and the Media. We've been working with them since the early 90s on this. This True. ain't no overnight thing. Oh, no, not at no, all. No, no, no. Not at all. Not at all. As a, um, as a follow-up to the initial appeal, um, you, have the get out, you have the Get Out of Way, Cuba's Way documentary. Mm -hmm. um, talk to us about, you have a couple concerts coming up. 
Yeah. Um, um, the 18th and the 19th, 25th and 26th. Uh, let us know mm-hmm. a little bit about that. Yes. Um, on the This weekend, the 18th and 19th, you have a network of people um, out of the West Coast. Um, attorney Bill Gonzalez um, and uh, his two other um, main partners that are working with him, they've organized an incredible um, concert for Cuba. Um Danny Glover is going to be involved in that. Michael Moore, the documentarian, is going to be involved in that. Um, Michael McDonald is one of the performers. Um, they're, they're having a major um, activity. We will send you the information by today, um, Dewan, so you can post that as a follow-up to push posting this interview. And then next week, on the 25th and 26th, we're having um, a performance virtual called Africa and the World, um, Thanks Cuba. So we're having artists from all over the world um, perform. Um, we reached out to artists in Guinea-Bissau, in Ghana, in Zimbabwe, in Kenya, in Guyana, in the Virgin Islands, in the UK, in Canada, in Haiti, and everything. So um, that's what we're that's what we're doing, and um, we're looking real forward to it. Matter of fact, um, someone told me uh, that you're performing, brother Dwan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna come on there and crack a few jokes. I'm cracking. Yes. Few jokes. So we're we're definitely going to. Um, we're looking forward to that, and um, and this is you know we're no strangers to this. Um, between uh, 2000, the end of 2013 and 2016, we co-produced. Um, three albums with M1 from the internationally acclaimed hip-hop group Dead Press called the Battle Cry for Cuba and Zimbabwe Project, where we they were artists all over the world that called for the lifting of the sanctions on Zimbabwe and the blockade on Cuba. And um, we did a concert around releasing the Cuban Five um, six years ago in Washington, D.C. that was very successful. So we're back at it again, this time virtual, and this time we have people um, from all over the world I don't want to let the cat out of the bag and let certain names out of the bag, but by the time it's time to share with the world who's going to perform, we're very confident and optimistic that um, people from all over the world are going to check it out. So please, um, we'll send you the information about the concert um, this week. Matter of fact, I was, for some reason, um, our area was having some internet trouble, so now... um, we're good to go. So I have that information about um, the concert. I could read it real quickly as I open my computer. Okay. Um, it's it's this weekend. Um, it's called the Hot House Concert for Cuba. It'll be a two-day cultural event broadcast live from Havana's um, Instituto Cubano de la Musica. But people in Chicago, there'll be some stuff going on, New York and California. And there's a um it's www.twitch.tv slash hot house global. We'll send you the information. So it's a bunch of um Spanish speaking Africans, as they're called Afro um, Cuban Afro Cubans yeah. that are gonna be performing. And they're gonna be performances from folks in the United States. Danny Glover is, will be one of the MCs, um Michael Moore will be one of the MCs. They dug up um, David Soul, who was Hutch on Starsky and Hutch. Okay. Ed Ashner from the Mary Tyler Moore Show. So there are different people who have been um, supporters of Cuba through the years who will be lending their voice to that effort. And we want to congratulate um, Marguerite Horberg, Raul, Raul Cauza, and Bill Martin as ahead of time. And um, the great thing about this is we didn't even know about each other's performances but the Cubans put us together last Tuesday. We've been talking and we put out a joint statement today that we're working together um, to, to promote both efforts. And um, so that's what some um, that's what the world can look forward to the next two weekends. Once again, theirs is called the concert for Cuba that's coming up this weekend. And then next weekend, the 25th to the 26th, you have Africa and the world. Thanks, Cuba. And um, the reason is because, for people who don't know, the armed struggle to liberate Cuba from the neo-colonial Batista regime 
which Comandante Fidel Castro, Juan Almeida, Che Guevara, and others spearheaded, that um, they their first armed offensive was July 26, 1953. And six years later, against all odds, they emerged victorious. And Cuba, a new Cuba um, came into existence on January 1st, 1959. But they always want the world to remember that their starting point is July 26. And they name themselves the July 26 movement. So the same way that we celebrate um, the Haitian Revolution on January 1st, the same way we celebrate Ghanaian independence on March 6th, mm -hmm. the same way we celebrate Zimbabwe's independence on April 18th, the same way we celebrate um, African Liberation Day on May 25th, the whole world turns their eyes to Cuba July 26th. And we're just so humble that we're going to have the opportunity to do something to thank them for all the things that they have done um, for the African world, both in the diaspora and on the continent. And once again, this is in the scheme of pushing for their medical personnel, the Henry Reeve International Medical Brigade. And it's named after a Brooklyn-born Caucasian named Henry Reeve, who found his way to Cuba and fought on the side with the Cubans against United States and Spanish efforts to annex and colonize them. That's what's up. That's what's up. I got yeah. one uh, last question for you. Of course. And then, uh, in the course, if you want to have anything additional after the, you know, we got time. Um, in addition to the fight to bring Cuban medical personnel personnel inside U.S. borders, the Get Out of Cuba's Way movement has a component dealing with Cuba's heroic medical efforts in our mother continent, Africa. Please mm -hmm. talk about that and the work being strategically developed in conjunction with these efforts. Yeah, um, well, there are a few things. Um, if you remember, um, when you had us um, talk to Sister Ida, she had saw some work. One of the things, in addition to pushing for them, the um, Henry Reeve International Medical Brigade to come to the United States to deal with the corona pandemic, we feel that they need to be in the prison infirmaries. Um, so that and we feel that they need to be on Native American reservations as well, where our indigenous sisters and brothers have been forced. OK, so you have that. But um, in terms of the African continent, when the Millennial Fund was created to deal with HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria on the African continent, the former now late secretary general of the United Nations at the time, Kofi Annan, had paid a courtesy call to Comandante Fidel Castro. And he said to him, he said, uh, do you have any money to give towards this fund? Mm -hmm. And Fidel said, now, you know that this blockade has cost us over $100 billion since it was imposed, aimed at stifling our economy and crushing our patriotic spirit. But luckily for you, Mr. Anand, we believe that the human resource is the most precious we have to offer the world. And if the people who you're able to convince to bestow resources <laughs> on the United Nations. If you can find the capital, I will deploy 4,000 of our best HIV AIDS doctors, nurses, and specialists, and they will stay in Africa until HIV AIDS has been eradicated. And um, at the moment, we have around 20 million children that um, are HIV AIDS orphans. Wow. And... Um, you, you saw their work between 2014 and 2016, where they sprung into action and they went to Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia, and they neutralized the uh, Ebola pandemic in that place. Um, they have a particular style that they practice in Africa because Comandante Fidel Castro used to say that Dr. King wasn't the only one with an ambitious dream. He said his dream was to build a medical school as Cuba's debt to Africa for kidnapping our ancestors from Africa. He said that Cuba's his dream was to build a medical school, a branch of the Latin American School for Medical Sciences on the African continent. But until that dream can be a reality, the Cuban doctors, they treat the sick and all over the place. But when they're not treating people um, by the Dewan and listeners, they're treat they're training the doctors and nurses in these african nations who have agreed to remain in their their nations after they've been trained 
They're not going to come to New York. They're not going to come to Washington. They're not going to come to Detroit. They're not going to go to Paris. They're not going to go to Germany. They're not going to go to Denmark or Sweden. They're going to stay in their nations and be the best medical personnel their people have had access to that look like them. So um, for that reason, with more conversation about investing in Africa, and when you see people going to Ghana um, under the banner of the year return, which is a front for the United States Department of Commerce, which the U.S. Africa Business Exchange is part of, and it is in connection with the Corporate Council of Africa. So for those of you who are not just going to Africa and to Ghana or Nigeria to get the, pe- the your sisters and brothers who were born there to clean your toilets and cook your food and water your plants, mm-hmm. if you really want to invest in Africa's redemption, we feel the best project right now to invest in is we can create a resource pool to finance Cuba's medical efforts on the African continent. There's no reason why we cannot do that. And this will be a strong statement to who we believe is the most dangerous organization on the planet today, which is the United States Agency for International Development, which Kennedy created in 1961 in conjunction with the Peace Corps, who under the guise of humanitarian development, Um, use humanitarian aid as a form of bribery and intimidation and are always part of coup d'etat planning, assassination planning in every corner of the world. This is why Eritrea expelled them from their country in 2003, 2004. This is why Cuba, Haiti, Suriname, Bolivia, and Venezuela said there's no place for them in the African continent. And this may sting a little bit, but that's the organization that Barack Obama's mother used to work for. That's what she, a white woman like her, was doing in Indonesia in the 1960s, which was the place where the Bandung Conference took place, the Afro-Asian Conference, by the way. So um, it's an extension of intelligence. And when you listen to Obama's first inauguration, When he said that the might of the military must be matched by the um, strength of the diplomacy, meaning if you can bomb their cultural preferences to bomb, to invade, to conquer. But if they can't do that, they'll starve you to death. So that's what the sanctions, that's what the that's what imperialist sanctioning represents. So the United States Agency for International Development keeps Africa. And remember, Africa has received in the last 70 years four trillion dollars in debt but 400 but set 400 million people live on a dollar 90 cents a day or less to apply that to the united states reality if you go to a laundromat you can wash your clothes but you can't dry them if you get on public transportation you can get on but you can't get off can't get back you home. can't get back where you were going exactly so imagine living like that on a regular basis so this is this is this is this is what we're up against so we're saying that For people who are concerned about the poverty in Africa, but the diseases and the medical situation in the scheme of what we mentioned earlier about non-communicable diseases and Africa being the most vulnerable place because of the lack of infrastructural development. And for those of you who are uncomfortable with China for, you know, based on whatever your points of reference are, Cuba's track record is proven. There's no reason why we cannot approach the United Nations We cannot approach the African Union. We cannot ask the National Conference of Black Lawyers and the National Bar Association to come. And we sit down with the African Union. We sit down with the regional bodies, the Southern African Development Community, which represents Southern Africa, the Economic Community of West African States, COMESA, which is Western and East African States, the Northern African nations. And we can work this out. And there's no reason with the wealth that we have access to, or uh, that's a disorganization question, why every church in our community, every civic organization in our community, every fraternity and sorority in our community, every business organization in our community, and we know the names of them too, Mm -hmm. there's no reason why we can't spearhead an effort of that magnitude. It's a question of, it's not a question of ability, it's not a question, it's a question of will desire do we have it or not Mm -hmm. so we really believe that at this historical moment um understanding that one of our biggest challenges in closing 
is to be the beneficiaries of our own resistance. Yes, we're not yes. raise, we're not raising all this hell for Joe Biden to be the ultimate beneficiary. Where in the nineties, <laughs> when we brought this country to a stop and the smoke cleared, and Bill Clinton benefited from it more than we did. That's the cycle we're and trying. And then to break. threw us right back in prison. Yeah, exactly. So just just to know that when we when we are t- intensifying our resistance by the second, that we know that we are going to be the beneficiaries, no one else, not the Democrats, not the Republicans, not the police, not the intelligence agencies, not Fortune 500 companies that ruthlessly exploit us. Nobody but us are the ultimate beneficiaries, not being the gophers for an agenda we don't understand, not being the not being willing culprits in agendas we do understand that don't serve us, all of that, this gives us an opportunity because a lot of times when we go over the top critiquing things, one of the biggest disappointments is we don't have alternatives to offer our people. And we have to ask ourselves at every historical moment, what is worse, the atrocities committed against us or the predictability of our responses? It's that simple. Oh, yep, yep, yep. The predictability of our responses. I got I got one more question to ask you before we get out of here because I want to ask you to uh, open up and explain a little bit about uh, France. You know, there's a lot of people out there who, you know, we can talk all we talk, but they won't listen until a white person co-signs it. Uh, what, do you, what do you have to say about, about France not, uh, nominating Cuba's medical team for a Nobel Prize? The same thing you got to say about Italy, allowing them to uh, 54 Cuban medical personnel to come to Italy. Al Capone, Charlie Luciano, Tony Arcado, Carlo Gambino, Vito Genovese, we're all turning over in their grave. Mussolini as well. France, <laughs> when, we, when we think of France, we think of De Gaulle. We think of uh, Haiti being colonized. We think of Guinea. Guinea. We think of Francophone West Africa. So the fact that France um, made this push, it just shows that... Um, as Comandante Fidel Castro said, a long time ago, history will absolve me. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. That's it. We, That's it. And, 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 some, and Kwame Ture told me as a young guy, he said, um, you know, um, we understand that uh, in many instances, many people are denied the privilege of witnessing victory. So uh, Fidel doesn't get to see this. Che doesn't get to see this. Antonio Macheo doesn't get to see this. But in their name, we fight on and we'll just keep fighting and we'll we'll make um, we'll correct all the wrongs, especially the ones that African people and other poor and oppressed people are. are um, they have to feel the brunt of. It's our historical obligation to deal with these things. And all of this will be momentum. I'm feeling the way. That pe- that SNCC felt when they came amongst the other anti-war uh, organizers and they said, we're going to smash the draft. <laughs> and people told them it was romantic, it was idealistic, it wasn't being pragmatic. That's that's the way I feel right now. And I then feel it happened. That we're, yeah. <laughs> and, and then um, it happened. You know, and then the, the part I love the most about this is, um, I'll close on this one, um, in... 2004, I was working at Bowie State University running a dorm, and part of my responsibility was to organize programs for the students on campus. But when many of the professors found out that I was on campus, they wanted their departments to co-sponsor the programs, and they would bring their students to the, to the programs we would do. And uh, Bowie State University was on the verge in 2000 of becoming the first HBCU to have a cultural exchange program with Cuba. Hmm. And uh, the Bush administration came in, and um, nah. Condoleezza Rice put this Cuba nah. on the yeah on the on the outpost of tyranny list after Clinton had taken them off the national security threat list that the Pentagon had. So what ended Condoleezza up happening? Condoleezza Rice put them back. Yeah. Yeah. So what ended up happening um, with that? You know, is uh, as time went on, we uh, the students had a walkout on April fourth, two thousand three. And a retired police who ran the narcotics division of Baltimore's police, he took the flyer, circled my name, and sent it to Homeland Security. And um, I found out months later, after they did not, a year later, they did not renew my contract. 
But I got a call from a campus police officer that said, you know, we used to, you know, it's our job to watch the campus. Because I'm like, why are you calling me? I no longer work there. And he said, oh, you know, I just wanted you to know that um, we watched you. You know, that was part of our job just to watch the campus. And the students had a lot of respect for you. You know, they we watched the programs you used to do and all of that. And, uh, you know, um, so we were surprised that um, the FBI was here investigating you today. And uh, so what happened was I had my lawyer contact the officer, the FBI officer, and he said, oh, it's a routine when someone spends as much time with the Cuban diplomats as Mr. Egbuna does. We just have to look into it, but he hasn't broken any law. So um, for so I will say when we look at the role of J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI in the demise of our organized resistance, if if I was to be taken down. For st- I couldn't think of a better reason than to stand with the Cuban people and Cuban revolution. Thank you so much for having us on today, Brother Duan. It's been a pleasure. I appreciate you again, Obi, and we will have you back on in a few different capacities. And I thank you for doing what you do. Check mm-hmm. out, uh, for those listening, hotepish.com. We're going to update you, uh, give links when the, when the two performances come up. And yeah. Thank y'all for listening. I want you guys to remember, there are no perfect messengers, only perfect messages mm. for those who are willing to pick up game. We out. Thank you. <laughs>